Well, God bless you, and thank you so much for tuning in to our Bible study today. I'm so excited. You know, one of the things I, I believe is that God's Word just continues to grow on us, continues to bring forth revelation, and we're going to continue on in the Best Of series, but I'm going to go to some Bible studies that I believe really spoke to our congregation as we are mentally preparing ourselves for coming back into the sanctuary re-engagement. I want to kind of get your palate kind of ready for what that looks like. And there's a message I, I talked about uh, understanding the origin, tactics of demons and how they attack our lives, but how to win that war. I want to take you into this very strategic Bible study and I want you to prepare your heart because it is going to bless you. 
So what I want you to do is I want you to brace yourself and get ready because it's going to be amazing. And uh, I just want to thank God for you. Now listen, make sure you follow me at Joseph Walker 3. Uh, make sure you connect with my wife, Dr. Steph Walker. This is going to be an amazing service. And I promise you, God's going to do something amazing. If you're a first-timer, we're excited to have you share. And uh, listen, let me tell you something. God is good. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to prepare your heart to give. Let's sow liberally. We believe that this is good ground. Mount Zion Church is good ground. So I want you to prepare right now to sow, and let's do it to the glory of God. We thank God for you. Let's get ready to be blessed by this word. Let's do it now. All right, today we're going to begin a series that I believe will kind of open up an area for many of us that is so needed, a comprehensive understanding of demons. And when I talk about mortal combat, I want you to first of all know that I need your prayers because anytime a leader begins to minister in this area, he or she sets themselves up for attack. So I want you to make sure if you really are an intercessor to just say, Lord, cover my pastor as he deals with this particular dimension. Now, the scripture says to us in 1 Timothy 4 and 1, now the Spirit expressly says in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, this is important because every encounter, every relationship that you have, in your life, they are good and they are bad. When you encounter these relationships, there has to be a level of discernment, a pause. That you have to begin to ask yourself, am I vulnerable as a result of that relationship or am I wiser? What did that relationship or encounter do for me or to me? When you deal with demons, you must understand that there were absolutely no good encounters with demons. They're all bad. No way around it. And when you're dealing with demons, people of God, you must understand you come face to face with demonic spirits. You are in the fight for your life. This is not a plaything. Spiritual warfare is not a simulated exercise. When you are dealing with spiritual warfare and demons, there are strategies that have to be employed if you're going to overcome them. There are many of us who go every single day without realizing that there's a spirit world at work in our lives. We live in the natural, but we're also spirit. And often we view the spirit realm as mystical, like this, it's so mystical. I don't know if I can't touch it or feel it. Everybody believes in mysticism or they believe in this idea of things that are beyond the natural when you talk about heaven. You know, you've never seen heaven, but I'm going to heaven. But nobody wants to embrace hell. <laughs> there's a heaven, there's a hell. So when you think about it from that perspective, then you begin to realize, people of God, Satan and his demons are very vicious and they are very intentional about destroying your life your reputation, who you are, your destiny. But it's important to know the authority and power that you have. Remember this verse in Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Jesus says you have this authority, this power, so you have to know who you are. Just say this together. I have authority and power over every evil spirit. Now, you have to hold on to that because throughout tonight, you're going to have to remind yourself of that. Now, my friend Cindy Trim has a book, um, Binding the Strong Man. In verse, page 15 of that book, she says, and I quote, his activities are illegal because disembodied spirits were not given authority to operate in the earth. This is why Satan had to possess the body of a snake in order to gain legal access. Possession is his current strategy for control in the earth realm. So Satan and his demons, in order to gain possession of the earth, they must do it through a human body or a willing vessel. 
They need something to possess. Demons have no power unless they come through you. The way they gain access to you begins at the point of offense. When you are offended. When you are offended by someone or something, your natural response is often your flesh. The magnification of your flesh. I dare you. What did you say? Bring it on. Your flesh swells up, creating portals whereby demons attach themselves to that carnal side of you in hopes of coming into your life and causing torment, causing you to act out in ways that you would never act out if you were in the spirit. Why do you think Romans 8 and 1 says, there is therefore no condemnation to those who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit of God. So what the enemy wants to do is to get you angry enough, bitter enough, wounded enough, frustrated enough to create a portal of access whereby demons can attach to that. And all of a sudden, you find yourself wrestling with demons inside of you. You see, people of God, listen carefully. We have to understand these tactics of the enemy, and we have to, first of all, know what demons are. Now, let's be very clear. I want you to get out of your mind the Hollywood understanding of demons that you saw in The Exorcist. And I really want you to hear this. Biblical historians teach us that demons were fallen angels. They were, according to the scripture, also referred to as, as unclean spirits. So what we discover here, people of God, there are certain characteristics of demons. Let's see what they are. They are spirit beings. Demons do not have bodies. They are disembodied spirits. They have no physical form whatsoever. So demons do not, do not have a body of themselves. That's why they need a body to occupy. The book of Matthew records in Matthew 8 and 16, it says that when the evening had come, they brought unto him many who were demon-possessed. He cast out the spirits with a what? Word. Healed all who were sick. Think about that for a moment. The demons were cast out by a word. It is the power of the word that cast out demons. Demons don't flee on your word. They flee on his word. But watch what happens. If I am offended and my flesh rises up, I am no longer receptive to the word. Or the enemy makes me want to stay at home because I don't feel like going to church. So I don't get a word. So therefore, if I'm not full of the word, I'm not full of faith. So there was no authority in what I say. So demons then come in and compile my life because I don't have a word to counter the attack that's coming against my life. But when I am constantly being fed the word, then the word becomes my response. Jesus is tempted in Matthew chapter 4, and he tells the devil, but it is written. It is written. When you have the word, you don't have to give the devil a piece of your mind. You give him all the word. Get it? You see, people of God, demons belong in the spirit realm. And their only manifestation is to bring disorder into the lives of people they, in, they torment. The devil wants to come into your life and bring torment and disorder and chaos. Demons are personal intelligent beings. They are incredibly intelligent, believe it or not. Demons are very intelligent. Some, some people possessed with demons, you're like, hey, he's so stupid. Nah, demons are real smart. They are I'm going to prove it to you. For example, Matthew records the activity of demons and reveals the personality and the nature of them. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 through verse 32, when he had come to the other side, to the country of the uh, Gadarenes, there, Gadarenes, that met him, look what the scripture says, two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass by. Verse 29 says, and suddenly they cried out saying, what have we to do with you, Jesus, the son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Hmm. You see that? Let me, let me help you understand something. 
Hold on to that verse for a second before I go to verse 30. Notice what happens. Look here for a second. The demons are present. Jesus says nothing. He is the anointed one. Christ means the anointed. I just taught you a series last month on the anointing. When you have a relationship with Christ and you walk in the anointing, you don't have to say anything. When you walk in a room, demons know exactly who you are. Demons recognize your authority. What have we to do with you? Demons know who you are and automatically are afraid of you. The problem is you have allowed and trained your spirit to be afraid of demons when in fact demons are really afraid of you. Hmm. Watch what happens in verse 30. Now, a good way off from them, that was a herd of swine feeding, and so the demons begged him. Look at the demons negotiating. If you cast us out, permit us to go to the herd of swine. So guess what? He said, come out, and they went to the swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran down the mountain, and they would drown. Think about that. Remember, spirits, disembodied spirits need a body. They decided, let's go to the pigs, but they still drown. Demons talk. Demons make requests. Demons act in fear and reason and persuade. Please hear this. Demons love to negotiate. That's why many of you right now, you have been in situations where the Spirit of God has told you to release certain people from your life. Those were demons inside of them that were unhealthy for you. And the moment you got ready to have the tough conversation about, look, this is it. You know what the demon did? Try to negotiate. Let's do a 90 day trial. No, devil, you got to go now. Because demons like to negotiate. That's what they do. You'll see this in Genesis when we get to it. The demons always try to negotiate. They try to work things out. But they're unclean and they're vicious spirits. People of God in Matthew 8 and 28, the passage tells us the demon was violent and nobody could even pass by. So demons are violent. Demons create an environment around them that are so violent and toxic that 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 you are always in jeopardy when you are around them. Hmm. Because they are so vicious, people try to avoid them. But, as when, but when Jesus approached, they tried to maintain their territory. Now, please hear me well with this one. Oh, Father, let me say this right. Demons have territories. Hear me, hear me well in the Spirit of God. People of God, what I've discovered, I've learned this a long time ago. There are territorial demons. You call them social ills. You look at society and you say, oh, in that part of town or this, or in that part of town is this. That's because you look at it as a sociologist, or you look at it like that as a city planner, or you look at it like just as a normal coincidence. But when you are spiritual, you look at things spiritually and you realize these are territorial demons. For instance, think about the place you grew up in your mind right now. If it was Nashville, think about it. Whatever city, Detroit, wherever you were, Chicago, Atlanta, think about it. Just for a moment, get it in your spirit right now, the place you grew up. I guarantee you, if I would ask you, what do you think the territorial demon is over your city? You'd be like, probably this. Because most of the people in my city are dealing with this. It's a territorial demon. Every time I go into a city, I just got up from Atlanta, I'll be in Baltimore Friday. Every time I land in a city, when the plane is going into its final approach, I always pray the same prayer. After thanking God, I'm about to make it. I always say, Lord, reveal to me whatever territorial demon I'm about to confront and give me the authority to cast it out because I know the strongholds that territorial demons have. You think it's a coincidence that you go in certain places and there's certain, you know, the territorial demon. There's so much of this right here and so much of this right here. That's a territorial demon. Here's a thought for you. You don't have to tell anybody, but what do you think the territorial demon is where you grew up? <laughs> and what do you think the territorial demon is where you live now? And there are territorial demons on your job. You know how I know? Watch this. Because when you show up with your anointed self on a job, you ain't said nothing. You just walked in and people start looking at you crazy. What they were saying is, what have we to do with you? What would you come to do to us? Because the anointing brings fear into demons. Getting it? Do you know some are more evil than others? Some demons, they're not all alike. 
in Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 to 45, the Bible talks about how the unclean spirits, I will return to my house. And uh, when, when the demon had found no resting place, he wanders to waterless regions. And the Bible says he finds none. And, 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 and he returns to the house in which he came, and he sees it empty and clean and swept and put in order. And so he goes out and takes with him seven spirits more wicked than himself. And they may enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. So shall it be with this wicked generation. Really? You see, there were certain demons that, are, that can be cast out. Like, they're still evil, but there are certain demons that will just come out and they'll come out. There are some demons that you say, come out, and they'll look at you like, we're going to fight. The other demons, when they come out, they will leave a person as dead. They will tear a person. Some demons come out and leave damage. You know what those demons like? That's the person you could be in a relationship with and it was cool and everything was wonderful and y'all were loving each other. And the moment y'all got ready to get, leave and separate, they turn into like to Chucky e. doll. <laughs> and they were determined to destroy you on the way out. You're like, what is this? Who was this person? It's, not, it's the demon trying to destroy, trying to cause as much pain on the way out. People of God, demons, and you got to be careful because you can't deal with demons the same way. You can't. So, so they're numerous. Now, this is going to be an eye-opener for some of you. I'm giving it to bless you. Uh, Jesus asked a question in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 5. He asked the man who had a, possessor, a demon who was possessed by a demon, asked him a question. What is your name? And you know what the demon answered? My name is Legion, for we are many. Legion, many, a platoon. See, what we do oftentimes, and it's really no fault. I mean, I, I admire people who try to diagnose and treat a variety of social ills, and that's a, that's a place for that. And I think there's a, a very good uh, balance between clinical psychology and psychiatry and spiritual warfare. I think you have to have a delicate balance between the two, and I'll explain it in just a moment. But I do think it's important also to understand that you cannot make judgment calls on certain behavior without understanding what you're dealing with. The easy route is, is to judge the behavior and then classify it. And then once I classify it, I try to deal with it without understanding what I'm truly dealing with. For instance, it's easy to say, you got a demon of promiscuity. You need to slow that down. You, 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 you loose. You out there bad. You can identify that demon, right? Because the person just sleeps around so much. It's a demon, right? You know it's a demon of promiscuity because the person who has it hates it. It feels good while they do it, but they feel horrible after they do it. And they keep asking themselves why they're that way. So when you start saying, you got a demon of promiscuity, okay, okay, I get that. But that's not really the only demon you're dealing with. You're dealing with legion. So when you start dealing with legion, you got to ask yourself, but what's behind the demon of promiscuity? What's tucked away? What other demons are there? I'll tell you, the demon that came when they were six years old when somebody touched them inappropriately. It was the demon when they were 13, when they lost their virginity. When they were 15, when they had the abortion and didn't tell nobody. When they were 16 and the person rejected them and left them. And therefore, when they were 17 and the person who finally said, I love you, but if you give me sex, I love you. So they kept associating love with sex and sex with love. And so the demon attached themselves and so promiscuity came because they could only identify love with sex. So all of this legion is inside of them. And so you make a judgment and you think if you just take away the promiscuity, that's it. But laying behind, lying behind promiscuity is low self-esteem, depression, suicide, all those other demons. And you take promiscuity away and just because I ain't sleeping around no more don't mean I still ain't got this legion inside of me because I will find something else to attach to because one demon's gone and another demon steps to the plate and says, now deal with me. Legion. We are many. <laughs> so what you have to do is you have to go home and look in the mirror <laughs> and you have to look at the thing that you struggle with the most. And you look in the mirror tonight do it by yourself. Go in the mirror on your way to the shower when you're in your most vulnerable state. Nobody's watching. You and you in the mirror before you step in the shower or the bathtub. In that space, look in the mirror and say, what's the thing about me I hate the most that I do? What is that demon? And then ask God to show you your legion. 
show me what I'm dealing with. Show me where it started. Because I can't get out of this until I name every last one of them. That's personal. Everybody can't handle your legion. See, people of God, when I say there are many, this will blow your mind. This is going to blow your mind. Pay attention. In Mark chapter 5, verse 13, the Bible says of the man in Gadara. This is a man in Gadara. This is unlike the scripture in Matthew where there were two. This is one man in Gadara. A one man in the Gadara who was in the tombs cutting himself. And the scripture declares that Jesus gave permission to the unclean spirits. They went out into the swine. And there were about 2,000. And a herd ran bodily to a steep place into the sea and down and drowned in the sea. There was one man and 2,000 pigs ran violently down the field into the water and drowned. Pay attention to what I'm telling you. One man had 2,000 demons. Now, I know what you're saying. Is it possible for somebody to have that many demons and not be walking around here like the exorcist with the head going to the back? Oh, yeah. I can prove it to you. Watch this. So it's 2018, right? Correct? In your spirit for a moment, I want you to go back to 2008. Get it in your mind. Ten years ago. 2008. Remember where you were? Try Remember where you were? Try. 2008. Ten years ago, right? That's a good year, right? That's like, wasn't that the year? 2008. Remember what happened in 2008? Anybody remember what happened? Yeah, market crash. It was a tough time. But remember where you were. Now, remember... From 2008, every encounter, every relationship, everybody you interacted with, everybody in your inner space, in your house, close to you, whether intimately or not, that's not my business, just think about it. Everybody you embraced, talked to, opened up to, led around you from 2008 to right now. Now, when you think about that, think about every demon they might have had you were unaware of. So when they showed up, all their demons showed up looking for any access to you. And let's just say half of those demons attached themselves to you. I know what you're saying, but Bishop, I thought like if you, like if you sleep with a person, that's when you transfer spirits. That's why you should stay holy and you shouldn't do all this. And, and that's, wait a minute. You can catch a cold without touching somebody. This is what you say. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Ah, there's something going around my office. There's something going around my school. <laughs> Can I tell you something? It's something going around. You better get on that prayer call and ask God to cover you. It's something going around. You better guard yourself with the word of God. You better be sensitive to the spirit. There's something going around. The enemy is looking for access points. Think I'm making it up? Think about your friend who was the sweetest, nicest person ever that connected with a demon in a relationship and all of a sudden they start changing. You're like, man, you're not the same person. And the demon said, you tripping. Leave me alone. I am the same person. No, you're not the same person. All your friends say you change because we can see it, but you can't. Hmm. Demons are messengers from the devil, y'all. They are messengers. Even the even the religious folk know that. Jesus deals with an encounter in Matthew 12, 22 through 30. They brought him a man who was demon-possessed, right? He was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him. So the blind and mute man spoke and saw. Now, if I had time, I could really explain it to you because that's a demon in and of itself. The demon was, the man had a demon that caused him to be what? Blind and what? Now, those two, those two things in your body cause you to see and to talk. So there is a demon that controls your vision. 
and a demon that will control what you say. <laughs> Jesus dealt with the demon, restored the man's vision, and gave him power of word again. Watch this. And the multitude was so amazed and said, maybe this is that Jesus, the son of David. The Pharisees, the religious people said, this fellow does not cast out demons except Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. So they knew devil, the devil, Satan himself, ruled the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts, right? And said, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will the kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. How can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, lest he first bind the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Listen, here it is. Here's Revelation. Jesus says, please know this. The devil will not cast out the devil. Jesus says, you know I'm the son of God because I confronted the spirit and I cast it out. Satan is not in the business of casting out Satan. So can you make that make sense? See, a demon that's inside of you will, will never, will always resist being cast out when it's something that threatens itself. That's why some people, we like partial deliverance. And they start saying, you know, the Lord can heal. Hallelujah. Heal me, Jesus. The Lord, can, the Lord can turn it around. Yes, Lord, turn it around. All that. Pay your tithe. I'm so tired of him talking about money. Lord Jesus, because whatever demon is in you will always resist the word of God. You shout on everything else but the demon that's coming at you. <laughs> Live holy. I don't feel like just, can't judge me. Demons. <laughs> you know, anything that you, any demon that wants to stay long, you tune out when you hear the word about it. Now, what is interesting, I want you to say that, I want to say this to you. I believe the Bible, and I believe that God intended for the man to be the head of the house. I find it incredibly heroic when I see single mothers holding it down because you're the real sheroes. You are extraordinary women. I ain't gonna lie, y'all. <laughs> Woo! Because you are occupying spaces. You're holding it down. You're being mama and daddy for these kids, and you, you're to be admired. But hear me well. Hear me well. It was always God's design for the man to be the head of the house, to be a godly man, and for them to rule together. Not for him to rule over the woman, but to be the head of the house. The only reason why the serpent got into the garden is because Adam was out of position. He was a covering. He's always been a woman's covering. That's why the woman was the rib and the flesh cut. He covered her. It's not rule over her or tell her what to do. It's, it's that he's the covering. So it's the same thing. If I were to, if I want to, if I'm a robber, Deacon Strader, and I want to, I'm calculating a come to rob your house, and I know it's you and Lady Althea, and maybe if your daughter's at home and I'm a crook, I'm thinking, what's the best way to get his house? We got to first figure out how to tie him up. Because, see, I know Althea can fight, but... <laughs> Statistically, I got a better chance of beating her than I do you. So if I can tie you up, my chances are better. Because you're a strong man. Look over your life at every man in your family and ask yourself, my God, every man you ever encountered, father, uncle, brother, where was the attack? The attack got in your family because some strong man got bound. And that's why the son grew up letting the gang raise him. And that's why the daughter grew up looking for a surrogate daddy. Because the strong man was bound. You getting it? Imagine that. Imagine that. 
That's why men have to take their rightful place. Because you have to understand, you, when, those of you that's trying to date people, and if he can't pray, like, can you pray over dinner? No, you pray. You can't even pray over dinner. I know you can't cover me. That was for free. See, let me tell you something. There's a lot of beliefs about demons. Now, we're going to turn the corner now. It's going to get a little deeper for you now. There are beliefs about demons out there, right? A demon is uh, there's a variety of terms to describe demons. The Greek word, diamond, which refers to various sorts of demons, not only those who are evil, but sorts of beings, rather, if you will. But the most conventional understanding of demons are, is a malignant supernatural entity that seeks to harm humans. A malignant supernatural entity that wants to harm humans. Which means that, that a demon is, is something that is constantly trying to invade areas. A demon is not satisfied in one area. Once a demon attaches itself, it's malignant. It's not benign. It wants to keep spreading and moving in, in every area of your life. See how that works? So think about it for a moment. In the ancient world, that's why they didn't know how to deal with demons. So that's why they had a lot of magical potions and incantations and you see all this stuff because they were trying to figure out how to, how to confront these things. Where do demons originate? I'm going to give you a history lesson, a biblical history lesson. I'm going to give it to you in a way a child can understand it, okay? So the book of Jude, which is right before Revelation, right before Revelation tells us that there was this, uh, in, in, in verse 6, there is this abode, there's this place where demons abide. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that great day. Remember that verse. It'll come back to you in just a second. Let me tell you what happens. I want you to imagine something, right? Because we're going to go to Isaiah 14 in just a moment. I want you to imagine on your, and I, 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 I wanted to put this on the screen for you, but I, I, I'll, I'll dramatize it. Imagine, um, the heavenly throne. And imagine God sitting on this throne and the word to his right hand and the Holy Spirit to his left hand, right? But it's, it's all one. Now, imagine the cherubims, which are ministering angels in the choir loft of heaven. And all they're doing is saying, holy, 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 and crying, hallelujah to the... All they're doing is worship and worship and worship and worship. And the chief of them is the angel that God made. God made all the angels to worship him, but this angel in particular was perfect in stature, beautiful, handsome. He was, he was God's chief angel. He was the one who orchestrated the worship in heaven. And imagine one day that angel says, y'all, somebody else ought to be getting glory. It's, this, is, this is too much. Every day, all day, all we do is give him glory. Maybe somebody else ought to get glory. And a third of the choir said, you're right. And God said, are you kidding me? And God cast that angel and a third of those angels who were angels created by God. That's your answer. Did God create the devil? Created by God. They fell from the heavenly court before Genesis chapter 1. And they became demons. Now, Isaiah the prophet picks it up. He says, now here's what happened. In verse 12, he says, how are you falling from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. And for you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mountain of the congregation of the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. You going, what? Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest parts or depths of the pit. That's called hell. And those who see you will gaze at you and consider you and say, is this the man who made the earth tremble? Because they'll see all the stuff the devil did in the earth and who shook kingdoms. And he made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities who did not open. Remember Jude 6? Did not open the house of his prisoners. Huh. 
One other verse in Isaiah says, I saw Satan fall like the dragon who, whose tail took a third of the stars. Isaiah said his, the dragon who was Lucifer, his tail took a third of the stars. And that tail is still bringing down stars today. Anyway, Luke, I know you'll get that tomorrow. Luke 10, 18, Jesus says, I saw Satan like lightning. He fell from heaven. See that? So he failed. So wait a minute. He's a spirit. Get it? He's a spirit. Pay attention now. He's a, like angels are spirits. Get it? They have no bodies. Spirits. God is spirit. Everything in heaven is spirit because there is no flesh and spirit. Get it? So if Lucifer fell and a third of the demons fell with him, what did they fall? Well, Genesis 1 and 2. The earth was without form and void <laughs> and darkness was on the face of the deep fell there darkness and the spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters so this is what theologians call chaos because when God created the world he created order out of chaos the spirit of God is moving over the waters and these demons are in darkness God has not made the earth yet for them to fall in the earth. So he cast them into this space. So guess what? The reason why there's chaos, because these demons, they have nowhere to go. So guess what God does? In the beginning, God creates the heaven and the earth. So guess what happens? In Genesis chapter 3, now the serpent was more subtle the any beast of the field, because the spirit needed something to embody and chose something very convenient, something low down, creepy, and cute. Because the only reason the snake is ugly to you is because what you know about a snake, because there was enmity put between you and the snake. But before that, the snake was very attractive. The snake had legs. And the snake was low down still. Snake with legs, low down, and attractive. Probably in your list of contacts right now. <laughs> now just for the record, <laughs> just for the record, if you need a pictorial understanding of what Lucifer must have looked like. I'm going to give it to you in scripture. Maybe next week I'll show it to you, but I'll give it to you in scripture first. You can envision it. Imagine this in your mind. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12 through 19. Imagine what this looked like. Son of man, take up a lamentation against the king of Tyre and say to him, this is the prophet prophesying, but he's referencing Lucifer. Thus saith the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection. You were full of wisdom. You were perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. Get it? The garden of God. This is how you look. God put every precious stone in your covering. Sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. Your workmanship of your temples. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. When God created you, your intestines, your, your whole body was music. When you walked, when you talked, it was melodious. All you were was one musical angel. Hmm. 
You were just that beautiful. You were anointed. You were a cherub. You covered. You were the one. You were the cherub who covers. You were the one over the, all the other cherubs. You were the one that covered the choir. I establish you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stone. You were the one that could walk anywhere in heaven because you were worship. You were worship. You were the one that controlled the worship. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you by the abundance of your trading you became filled with violence within and you sinned and therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God and I destroyed you O covering cherub from the midst of fiery stones your heart was lifted up because of your beauty you got arrogant you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor I cast you to the ground I laid you before the kings that they might gaze at you listen to me Deductive reasoning should tell you something. If Satan was a cherub, the chief cherub, and Satan allowed narcissism to rise up in him that he refused to worship God and wanted it for himself. If as a consequence he got cast down and became cursed and became the devil and demons, what in the world, in the earth, do you think he hates the most? Those who will worship him. Which says that there is a demon assigned to keep you from worship. Because when you do not worship, it's because you don't mind being worshiped yourself. But when you worship, you take authority over demons because that's the one thing the devil cannot do. He cannot declare he is Lord of Lords. He is. Hey, people of God, listen. I'm almost done. I promise you. I hope this is helping you. I'm going to give you a scripture. I'll, I'll reference it. I won't read it, but I'll reference it for you because I want to move and get you out of here on time. In Genesis 6, something extraordinary occurs. The daughter's were beautiful in the earth. But then there were these huh, interesting figures walking in the earth as well. The Bible says daughters were born to men. The sons of God saw the daughters of men and they were beautiful and they took wives. And the Lord said, the spirit shall not strive with man forever for indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 and the giants, there were giants in the earth in those days. And afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bore children. Those are the mighty men who are old, men of renown. You see what happened, the sons of God, the daughters of men, was a intermingling between demons and humans that produced a generation of giants. Whenever a demon cohabitates, produces with someone who's a child of God, you produce a giant problem. You get it. People of God, listen carefully. These are the wicked demons that by the time of the flood who believe to have been in prison. There are some Demons who manifest in our lives. I want to give you this quickly and we'll be ready to go. How do I know if I'm being impacted or affected by a demon? How do I know? Watch this. Here are the signs. I'm using Mark chapter 5, 1 through 15 as a backdrop to give you some indication if you see somebody who has demonic activity. How do you delineate? How do you know it's true? Number one, this is going to bless you. Incapacity for normal living. A person is unsuitable for normal social interaction for friends and family. Usually what a person does is desire solitude, begin to withdraw into deep loneliness, and oftentimes become very passive and has no desire to change. This is how you know you're dealing with demonic activity in a person. They begin to withdraw from their family and friends, and they want to be in isolation by themselves and they don't want to change. 
because the demon always wants to get you in isolation because wherever's isolation, there is interrogation. Hmm. Demons also create extreme behavior. Violence will often be evident in the person's life. Extreme temper, tantrums, uncontrollable anger. This is what happens when a demon is present. It doesn't mean a person doesn't have a temper from time to time, but if you have a person who's uncontrollable temper, it's always, you know, here's that demon. Well, you got to go home and say, y'all be quiet. Don't, 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 don't make them upset. That's a demon. So nobody move. Shh, be quiet. Just be out. Shh. Tiptoeing around people. That's a demon. <laughs> Number three, personality changes. Multiple personalities exist in most serious cases of demon control. One of the things you have to be mindful of, there is a thing called bipolar disorder. People do have bipolar disorder, which is a clinical condition, but I do think there is a space beyond bipolar disorder where people do have multiple personality. And multiple personality disorder, I think sometimes is spiritual warfare. It is, it is a demons. I've seen both. I've seen people who had bipolar disorder. I've also seen people who had multiple personalities. I've confronted demons like that. You can be in a situation with a person and in five minutes you've gone through 12 different emotions with them. Okay? Number four, restlessness or insomnia. Demons like to keep you up. Because if a demon can keep you up, it torments you. You can't rest. Why can't I sleep? There are a variety of reasons why I know some of you can't sleep. But then you have to think about it. You may be dealing with a demon. Because if a demon keeps you up all night, he's robbing you of what God promised you, which was to rest. See, when you get home, read Psalm 3. David had warfare in this, and David couldn't sleep. And he said, God, put me to sleep. Cover me. I'm dealing with this thing, and I need your rest. That's a rest promised by God. Rest is a gift from God. And a demon is keeping you up all night, a demon is trying to do something. A demon is trying to get you irritated, agitated, frustrated to create portals to attack you. So when you ain't getting no rest, guess what? You edgy, you frustrated, it doesn't take much for you to go off on people because you hadn't slept. And guess what? Those are portals. Remember that word halt, H-A-L-T, hungry, angry, lonely, tired? Think about that for a moment. T number five, a terrible inner anguish. Demons will torment you over things you can't get over. Very acute moments that you just, in the natural process of time, you should get through some things, right? You give people enough time, they'll get over things. But there's things you can't ever get over that constantly torment you, that constantly create anguish. That's a demon trying to keep you locked in a specific place in time. Number six is self-injury. Suicide. It's a demon. A demon wants you to do something he doesn't have the strength to do himself. The devil is a coward. So a devil will make you hurt yourself. The man in the tombs was cutting himself. The devil will have you self-inflicting pain in yourself, putting yourself in situations that are damaging to you and ultimately trying to get you to kill yourself. That's a demon. Let me close by telling you this. C.S. Lewis says, people should not call for demons unless they really mean what they say. He says it in the last battle. What a wonderful book it is. Do you know something, people of God? Let me tell you something. You can't play with demons. I'm going to tell you a story as I get ready to close. In Acts chapter 19, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase this. When you get home, read it, 11 through 16. The scripture tells us that the apostle Paul was so anointed, he did extraordinary works among the people of God that his handkerchief even was used to heal people. His handkerchief was even anointed. And people were trying to replicate what he was doing to the degree that the Jewish exorcists even tried to do it as well. And on one occasion, there were the seven sons of Sceva. And the seven sons of Sceva came and tried to cast out a demon. And the demon said, Jesus we know. Paul we know. But who are you? And the demon overpowered the seven sons of Sceva and they ran out naked and ashamed. Because if you don't understand the strategies and tactics on how to confront demons, please get somebody who does and don't be playing around. I made a mistake one day. Don't laugh at me. And I'm trying to tell this story as I let you out of here. I made a mistake one day. There was a wasp in the house. A wasp. I grabbed some spray from under the cabinet that kills ants. 
looked like wall spray. I just grabbed it and started spraying ant spray on the walls. And the walls kind of look and set his eye on me. And I was running through my own house spraying ant spray on the walls. Hear what I'm trying to tell you. If you don't have a level of authority and understanding of these demons, they will have you run into your own house talking about, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong, Pastor? What am I doing wrong? Jesus said, some come out by prayer and by fasting. You can't play. Let me tell you this. Hear me well. I promise you. I'm over time, but I'll make it up to you. I promise you. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and printed powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I asked God years ago, why'd you call me? Not, not in the sense of not wanting to do it, but why did you expose me to this? Because God took me and he really called me. Ministry not a vocation for me, like I just something I wanted to do. God called me. And when God called me, I started seeing life differently. Because when he anointed me, so you, you take this, you say, oh, Bishop, so anointed. Let me tell you something. When you do what I do, you have a heightened sense of discernment. I can't escape it. When I was preparing the word for you, on breaking the yokes. I went through so much attack. I even preached about it, right? The devil on my chest. See, when I show up and I'm ministering to you, I don't see flesh. I see spirit. I see demons. You couldn't handle what I see sometimes. Some of you would run right out of here. You'd be like, oh my God, because I want God to turn it off sometime. Like, God, turn it off. But God reminds me, we were never meant to see people in flesh. From the beginning of time, we were never meant to see people in flesh. You were always meant to see people in the spirit. And they were naked and not ashamed. But we have now started seeing people in flesh. Oh, you're fine. Oh, you're handsome. Oh, you're cute. Look at your hair. What you wearing? It's all flesh. The devil lives in carnality, but the fight is in the spirit. So we wrestle not because if you did it in flesh, you wrestle in flesh and you ignore the spirit. And you don't realize that over your head, there are spiritual things happening. And you're so tied up in flesh, you don't realize what you're dealing with. The closest thing to heaven and the earth is a child. A child, a baby, just came from heaven into this world, untainted and pure. You want to know what spirit you're dealing with? Watch how that baby act around certain people. <laughs> I pray that God will give you such is the kingdom of God. Suffer the little children. I pray that God would give you that kind of discernment that you could see things in the spirit, that you will trust this, that when you walk into a room or a space or around somebody and the Holy Spirit tells you something ain't right, that you would actually trust that for now. That you would say, it's something about this. Some of you wish you could get that back. It would have saved you five years off of your life had you trusted that voice. There were demons around you every single day. And trust me when I tell you this, as your pastor, when I'm up here looking around, I'm in the spirit. I can see what's on people. And I pray for you. And oftentimes you have no idea that your pastors are praying for you because we deal with warfare 24-7. You go through life not knowing it, but we deal with it all the time. Because every demon that you deal with, God puts on us to have to minister through it just to get a word to you. That's why we do it by the word of God. 
That's why you need an anointing and that's why you need a prayer life because this stuff is real, y'all. Wow, well, what can we say? What a powerful move of God. And I wanna thank you so much for tuning in to this wonderful series of messages. Amen. This is what we do. We don't forget where we come from. We thank God for the experiences that have molded us as a ministry, and I want you to stay connected. So I want you to make sure if you didn't get a chance to give, do that. Stay connected to me. I'd love to hear from you. Let me know. Let's fill up the chats. Send me a message on Instagram. Let me know how these messages, how you're enjoying this series. It would bless me to hear that. So I look forward to that. And thank you for staying connected. Thank you. If you want a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want you to know right now, salvation at mtzionnashville.org, you can experience it right now. Our team will follow up with you. Salvation at MT Zion Nashville. You want to become a part of our ministry? You want to connect? Let's do it now. Until next time, may God bless you and yours. That's our prayer.